It's my pleasure to always have Earl Schwartz with us, Professor Earl Schwartz from Hamlin University, our curator of our interfaith text study. He uh, was available tonight to speak on um, a really great topic. So Earl, it is your turn. If you wanna unmute yourself, I'm gonna share my screen. Everyone was sent the PDF of his reflections for tonight along with a couple discussion questions. And since we're a little short on time, maybe we'll kind of do one big group discussion. How do you, how do you like that idea, Earl? Sounds good. Thank okay, you. well, you're welcome. Let me get my screen going for you. Here you go. Thanks very much. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be with you again. And wonderful to learn along with you from the presentations that we've heard already this, this evening. In, in this evening's study, we're going to focus on a reference to imprisonment that appears, first of all, in the book of Psalms, and then reappears in the traditional Jewish daily liturgy in a context that I hope provides us ample food for thought in our conversation. And since having those conversations are our primary purpose for this portion of our gathering, to use our sacred scriptural traditions to speak with one another about the most important concerns that we share, I want to introduce that reference now and move as quickly as possible to our discussion. Psalm 146, as you can see, begins with the sobering assertion that when a person's life is over, it's over. Altif tuhu bin divin, beven adam she'en lo tshua. You, you really can't pin your hopes on nobility, on a, on a human being who just doesn't have the power to rescue anyone. His life breath leaves back to the earth, and that's the day one's plans all come to an end. Sobering, even despairing. And yet, as you can see just a few verses later, the psalm goes on to build towards the rallying affirmation that God, as we read, the one who makes the skies and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, the one who's trustworthy forever, God makes for justice for the oppressed gives food to the hungry. The eternal one sets free those imprisoned. And the Hebrew for that expression, setting free those imprisoned, as you can see in the parentheses, is matir asurim. This juxtaposition, this placing side by side of despair and hope in the psalm, despair about human capacity and hope that God sets things right. The juxtaposition of those two themes is striking in and of itself, striking as it is. But as is our practice in our study, we like to look at a commentary that raises an interesting question or two about that primary text. And this evening for our commentary, I'd like us to consider a liturgical afterlife, as it were, for the expression matir asurim, the one who frees the imprisoned. Let me say that that expression only appears in this one place in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. So that when it reappears in the context that we're gonna be looking at in just a moment, it almost certainly is quoting the Psalm. But as we'll see, this is quite 
a different context for the expression. It comes from that part of the liturgy known as Gvurot, which has to do with God's powers. And as you can see, the passage reads like this. The one who sustains life out of gracious kindness, who revives those who have died out of great mercy, supports those who are falling and heals those who are ailing, and now our expression once again, and sets free those imprisoned, matira surin, and keeps faith with sleepers in the dust. Who is like you, master of powers? Who can compare to you, a king who causes to die and revives, who brings rescue to bloom? You can be trusted to revive the dead, your blessed eternal one who revives the dead. That expression, frees the imprisoned, matir asurin, is replanted in this liturgical passage. It's a very old passage, probably a couple thousand years old. That is to say, uh, uh, maybe two or 300 years between the completion of the Hebrew Bible and the formation of this liturgical passage. And let me ask, if you compare where the expression matir asurim came from in Psalms with where it ends up here in the Jewish liturgy, do you see anything surprising about this new setting for the expression? Is there anything that uh, leaves you wondering about the expression reappearing liturgically in this particular context. If you look at the Psalm and look at the prayer text, what seems to be incongruous about the two contexts? Any thoughts? Anything that doesn't match up? Any thoughts? The premise of the psalm seems to be that God's power to do justice, to feed the hungry, to free the imprisoned, has to do with human powerlessness after life. That when our life is done, it's done. What about the liturgical context for the expression. What's different about that? Was there a comment in the chat? Let's see. Well, yes, that, uh, I think that's right, Mary. That's true, but what is the overall theme of the liturgical passage? Unlike the passage from Psalms, the liturgical passage is all about it's all about resurrection of the dead. It's all about the idea that when life's over, it's not over. The framing of the expression in the liturgy seems to be at polar opposites with the use of the expression in the Psalms. And that leads me to our primary discussion questions. When you put these two texts side by side, what do you make of the idea that the expression supports those who are falling and heals those who are ailing, and sets free those imprisoned, Matir Asurin has been placed at the heart of a liturgical passage about resurrection of the dead. Exactly what its original context 
was not about. What do you make, as it were, of the expression, freeze the imprisoned, being resurrected in this way? Any thoughts, any comments? Chats. They need a metaphorical. What do you mean by a metaphorical expression? Resurrection. What do you have in mind? They need a metaphorical resurrection. I think we're on to something. Anyone want to take that a little further? Dead and near dead. They're still alive, but not part of the community. And in that sense, sharing something of death. Am I reading you correctly? That this expression, which originally came from a psalm all about how death is the end of life, is now placed in a context where resurrection is the overarching theme. Death is separation, prison is separation, God is on the side of the oppressed. That there is something going on with the liturgist who lifted this expression from its original context and put it in this one. That stumbling, that falling, that sickness, and that prison calls for resurrection. Would anyone like to take that any further? They're also exiled, figuratively or literally, Mary says, or literally to the dust heap. And it's so hard for convicted folks to get housing after prison that it might be quite true today. And that key takes us to the second question. You'll note that immediately after the appearance of the expression, freeze those imprisoned, the liturgical text references those who sleep in the dust. And that expression seems to go two directions at once. What might I mean? Those who sleep in the dust. It's a very, very powerful image, and it seems to cover a whole lot of liturgical ground. Those we forget, the poor. Does it abandon the theme of resurrection of the dead? Those who sleep in the dust could metaphorically refer to the dead. And those who sleep in the dust can simultaneously refer to the homeless, those buried by society's pressures, overwhelmed, those who have stumbled, those who have fallen, those who are bound and imprisoned. Any more thoughts about those last two questions and the impact of taking the expression, freeze the imprisoned and placing it liturgically in a passage about resurrecting the dead. Any additional thoughts? Aha, a mark of repentance. And what do you mean, Laura? What do you mean a mark of repentance? Job. Oh, oh, that's I mean, in, in, in dust and ashes in the sense of being brought to your lowest point, whether by things you've done or things you've not done, but in this place of kind of desperation um, for some that can bring life transformation. And then to live again, literally an after life, after the stumble, after the illness, after the imprisonment. We speak daily in this liturgy to a God who promises resurrection after 
life. Yeah, same parallel, Annie says, that giving a home to those who sleep in the dust is like giving life to the dead, just as freeing the imprisoned is like giving life to the dead. Divine work, and Pam says, to imprison someone is analogous to killing them, to robbing them of their ability to be fully alive. I think, Pam, that sure seems to be what the liturgist is suggesting. Didn't people in ancient times repent by covering themselves? Absolutely, Mary. What an interesting metaphorical connection in dust and ashes. Absolutely. And the liturgist would have been well aware of the association of repentance with being covered in dust. And maybe we have a responsibility to work at giving new life to the oppressed among us as God grants us resurrection. Absolutely. Well, with just a moment left, first, let me thank you for the exchange. Let me summarize that what we've seen is an expression that first appears in the Psalms in a context which I've characterized as somber and sobering that reappears in the traditional Jewish liturgy as an expression of hope and divine purpose. I would summarize our conversation this way. One may end up sleeping in the dust when one's life is over, or when one falls, and when one falls ill or by running afoul of the law and its punishments, but day by day at the very heart of the traditional Ju Jewish liturgy is the message we've seen. Resurrection isn't only for those who have lost their life breath and returned to the earth. Resurrection is for the living as well. And to pray these words daily is to affirm that we mortal human beings can help give life back to the living. And that's been our purpose better equip ourselves to do just that all evening. Thank you for those who presented before me. Thank you for those who have attended and all the best. Thank you, Earl. It's always a pleasure to learn from you and to learn from everyone. That chat was just great. Um, I miss you all. I miss not having dinner and being in community together. So hopefully soon. Um, 2021, again, let's just all hold it together and we can make it to 2021 together. So thank you again. If you are interested in training in January, please reach out to myself or Brenda or Randy and we'll get you on that list and we will send out the recording of tonight's event to you as well. Please feel free to share it, share it widely with all those you know in your community and your network. We thank you for tonight and this evening. Be well, continue to stay well, keep masks and be safe, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night.